So the point of Project Greenlight is to help promising filmmakers get their foot in the door. But this new season of the reality show has accidentally done more than that. It has actually revealed some of Hollywood's biggest problems. Today on the show, you'll hear how the messiness of Project Greenlight is actually the perfect representation of Hollywood. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Look, I think the perfect place to start is with this. When we're talking about diversity, y- you do it in the casting of the film, not in the casting of the show. Whew. Wow. Okay. Yikes. That is Matt Damon. That is a moment from the reality show Project Greenlight. In case you're not familiar with it, Project Greenlight is a show about giving an up-and-coming filmmaker the chance to make their first big-budget film. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck produced it and appeared as mentors on the series. The clip that you just heard right there, uh, well, it went viral, ended up creating a bit of controversy to the point where Matt Damon ended up apologizing. Project Greenlight ended up being canceled in 2016, and now it is back. Project Greenlight is uh, back with a brand new team. Issa Rae, Gina prince Bythewood, and Kumail Nanjiani are the new powerhouse mentors behind the reboot of the show. It is called Project Greenlight, A New Generation. Is it messy? Yes, it is. Sarah Ty Black and Jennifer Holness are here to talk about it. Jennifer, Sarah Ty, welcome to the group chat. Hi. Hey, everyone. Hello. Okay, let me just start, <laughs> Sarah Ty, by asking you. We're going to get to the new season of Project Greenlight in a moment. But that clip that we played of Matt Damon in season four, it went viral. It was quite a heated exchange. Why do you think it was such a big moment? I mean, for me watching that, like just to give the context, that it's Effie Brown, the, the force behind Dear White People, which was huge. Um, and she's kind of pushing back at this characterization that's happening and then they're having this back and forth about what diversity means whether it's in front of this in front of the camera behind the camera and I think it was such a big moment in terms of the folks that I'm aligned with Mm. because it's it's evidence it's proof I'm so glad she has proof of that kind of conversation because so many of us don't have that you know Mm. and I think like for those who aren't familiar with the original Project Greenlight it's so funny to watch there's like six and a half hour long whole series on youtube you can watch it there's like courier typewriting noises you walk into the room everyone's a white man like i would be like wrong room like the most diverse thing in the room is like ben affleck's like strangely regionally specific spanish accent it's like (laughs) it, it feels like it's from the 90s and it's not and it's really tragic and sad and this moment was so huge because it was like yeah, I see it as like this moment of evidence of how clearly redacted swear word up things are in the industry. Love a redacted swear word. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, the moment seems to have gone viral because here is this Matt Damon, a white man, sort of explaining what diversity is to someone who is not white. And it was just kind of a jarring thing. What was your reaction when that moment happened? Okay, well, I actually saw it years ago and yes. I tried to channel the feeling and what it was, was I was completely shocked um, because for me, what it was, was a raw exercise of power. Mm. You know, I mean, the way he spoke over Effie, his, his moral authority, um, mm. his belief that he had to explain diversity to a black woman who had been invited into that room not because she was privileged, but because of sh- the magnitude of her hard work, the sheer hard work that woman had to put up to get in that room. Mm. But when he said, you know, and I think the quote earlier, um, when you're talking about diversity, and I wrote this down, when you're talking about diversity, you do that in the casting of the film and not in the casting of the show. That was a moment. Yeah. That was like everything. And now looking back, as I looked at a clip again, just recently for this. Yes. Um, through today's lens, okay, so this is the post-George Floyd, the post-Me Too, post-Oscar So White, what he said is actually crazy. Mm. You actually, like, I think back then, we couldn't even understand how wrong he was because today, working in the industry, what it actually means now is the acknowledgement, or some acknowledgement even, yeah. that... It 100% matter who gets to tell the story, who gets to write mm-hmm. it, who gets to direct it, who gets to produce it, who owns it, and who gets to hire. That is everything. And so, I mean, you couldn't be more wrong. And so it was really interesting to see it again uh, with 
these lens, these new lens. And like Why? the irony is if, <laughs> if there was more diversity behind the Matt Damon era of Project Greenlight, that moment probably would have been cut from air. <laughs> yes. That's true. A hundred percent it would have been. But I'm glad you brought that up because like in a way, actually, this new season, Jennifer, is kind of about atoning for that. Like yes. this whole new season about saying, you know what, that Hollywood is much more diverse than it was even five, six years ago. We're getting better at this thing. The first couple of episodes of the season ad nauseum repeat that very refrain, right? Like all the people who are involved in it are saying, this is a different moment in Hollywood. Based on your experience as a director, as a producer, how true to the filmmaking experience does that reboot feel for you? So I actually, oh, is that for me? That is for Um, you, yes. Okay. I feel it was very off. Okay. What they're doing feels very authentic. Mm. Um, The reboot is needed, but it's really, really interesting because what it also reveals is that while representation matters, it's not the whole piece. Mm. I personally feel like um, in watching the first two episodes, um, I feel like they actually are not protecting that director in the way that they should. I think they're kind of making some of the same mistakes. Hollywood Mm. hasn't changed. What's actually changed are cool, smart, diverse people are trying to do this, but they're doing it in the same way Hollywood does it. And that is not healthy. So for me, for example, to give someone a a, a project yeah. and a script that needs fixing and say, you got to fix that script while prepping on a project that you didn't author yeah. and be ready and all of this and, oh, and change your personality to suit us crazy so I, yes yeah so that's my take on it. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up too because <laughs> that something about the way that the director that they've chosen for the season is edited is almost supposed to make her representative like look like the villain of the show because yeah. she wants to like sometimes take a weekend away from the project yeah. you know like and they sort of expect her to work constantly i want to play a scene from the current season of project green light a new generation the director who eventually wins the chance to direct their first big movie she's a black woman and up to this point in the series every person this director has hired to work with them has been white and male. Here's a bit of what one of the producers of Project Greenlight, who is also black, said to that director. As you go on to become this huge star that you are, you're going to be a walking economy. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? So you're going to be able to give people these chances and take risks on people, right? And where a lot of people screw up is that they want to take Miko after already Miko, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to give chances to people early on, or they want to find that incredible black woman production designer who's already done four movies mm-hmm. don't want to give them their first movie, right? Because mm-hmm. they're scared to fail. And a big part of this is inherent risk. If we hire everything else right, mm-hmm. we can withstand something not working. Sarah Ty, what'd you make of that conversation? I mean, that whole episode itself, it was so like disappointing and sad to see, you know, it's because mm-hmm. on one hand, there's obviously like what's shaping Miko's choices is inherently white supremacy it's that feeling of like i can't afford to mess up it's the feeling of like maybe i can't afford to bring people with me but at the same time like this is isa ray this is like i'm rooting for everybody black and as much as i also acknowledge that there's like inequitable structures that are governing the choices of what she thinks are potentially best like do we need a white guy named Tyler whose favorite movie is Blade Runner doing the production design on your film? <laughs> like it's giving, <laughs> it's giving florals for spring. It's a, it's a really good reminder that you can't like gauge someone's politics based on their identity. Um, but yeah, it's just, it just really made me sad because I think you can't go into this opportunity knowing who Issa Rae is and thinking in that way. So yeah, I just, I, I wish all the best for Miko. I really do. But it, it was sad to see someone who thought that they couldn't bring folks with them. Jennifer, last word to you. We got about a minute left here. This topic of diversity is something that is constantly coming up in Hollywood. Why do you think they just can't seem to get it right? Okay, it's two parts. I think Sarah Ty said it. You know, rep, just because um, you get you hire diverse people, representation matters, but it also matters who who you're hiring yeah. to be res- representative because not everybody has the right politics and so you have to really do the work so i do think gatekeepers is fundamental we got to change those gatekeepers mm. so having the isarays and so forth but they also have to really look at who is you know who is making the decisions like what are their politics 
what are the goals of what you're trying to accomplish and are they in line? Because, you know, because I think that's what it's showing, you know, mm -hmm. but, and I also do think that um, her politics is messed up. Miko's politics is a bit messed up for me, but mm -hmm. I also think that um, I don't think that they're, they're not supporting a director in the way that they need to, because the inherent structures of Hollywood are messed up and they're going from that point. Sarah Ty, Jennifer Holness, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah Ty Black is a freelance film critic. You can read their work on CBC Arts and the Global Mail. And Jennifer Holness is an award-winning director, producer, and writer based in Toronto. There's a good chance that you remember the story from 2020. There was a bird watcher in Central Park who asked a woman to put her dog on a leash in an area where dogs are supposed to be on leashes. She refused, but she didn't stop there. She phoned the police. There is an African-American man. I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. And I'm like, ooh. We're going there. <laughs> and, you know, I sort of had a decision to make, which is, you know, do I capitulate to this attempt at racial intimidation um, or do I just keep doing what I'm doing? Unfortunately for her, I mean, she basically, she pulled the pin on the hand grenade of race and tried to lob it at me. And instead it blew up in her face. Blew up in her face is a correct way to put it. It really did. This took place back in May of 2020. And it kicked off a conversation around, around race at a time when it was already supercharged. It also made Christian Cooper a household name, even though he had already had an extraordinary list of accomplishments to his name. And now he can add another accomplishment to that long list. Christian Cooper is the host of a new show on National Geographic. It's called Extraordinary Birder. I recently spoke with Christian. Here's our conversation. Christian, hello. How are you? Hi, Elamin. How are you? Not too bad at all, man. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate yeah. it. My pleasure. Listen, before we get to the new show, when you hear that audio, where does it take you? Well, it kind of puts me back into that moment, you know, yeah. which was, uh, I think we were both pretty stressed out. But, you know, it's not really about either of us. It's about the racial bias that the the moment brought to the fore that I think a mm. lot of people who aren't Black maybe thought was, were not aware of. They thought, yeah. oh, Obama's been elected Racism is over. And it's like, well, no, actually, it's very deeply embedded into our culture. And that was kind of a revelation, I think, for a lot of people. It's a, I, I can't imagine having that level of just like distance from it, of saying like, it's not really about either one of us, it's about this larger thing. Uh, did it take you a long while to sort of see that perspective? Or is it like, even like within the sort of maelstrom that followed, you're kind of like, no, no, this is not about this particular incident. It's about something much bigger. I think maybe because it started as such a mundane confrontation between a birder and a dog walker, and that's yeah. quite honestly happens all the time in that part of the park. Sure. Um, so, so for it to take on this whole other life, I, I had to think about, well, what's that about? And part of mm. it was about what happened later that same day, which is that George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. And that's where you see that racial bias having real significance mm -hmm. because that racial bias allowed a white police officer in Minneapolis to think that it was appropriate for him to kneel on a black man's neck until he was dead. Yeah. And for the other uh, police officers around him, that racial bias made them think that it was okay to stand there and do nothing mm -hmm. while this happened and right in front of them. So that's why the racial bias, bias is what matters, not, you know, anything between the two of us. So you're sort of able to um, draw on the thing that you love, which is watching birds, um, to sort of move on from that particular incident. And listen, when I, when I say that you have an extraordinary list of accomplishments, we should just bring listeners into this. You went to Harvard. You're one of the first openly gay writers and editors of Marvel Comics. You created some LGBTQ plus characters for Marvel. You published your own comic book, a best-selling memoir. But your true passion is bird watching, something that you've been doing since you were a kid. What do you love about watching birds, man? Oh, what don't I love about it? It <laughs> is uh, uh, the way I uh, explain it to people is uh, I sort of eventually just codified it as the seven pleasures of birding because I got so tired of trying to tell my friends yeah. why they would not see me for the duration of the spring migration at all. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of things to love. But principally, it goes back to the fact that birds communicate with the same senses that we do. You know, we mm. love our dogs, we love our cats, but their primary sense is their nose. 
Whereas birds, their primary senses are the same as us. They use they use sight and sound. Mm. And so we can appreciate the spectacular colors, the incredible patterns, the sounds they make, and particularly in the songbirds, the beautiful music they put forth into the world. And that's all something we are perfectly equipped to appreciate. Yeah. Add to that the romance of the fact that birds fly, that they are the ultimate symbol of freedom, something we all dream about being able to do under our own power. Yeah. And, you know, birds are just, they're it. I don't have the immediate training to be a bird watcher, which is to say I don't always notice birds around me. But I have a six-year-old, and my six-year-old has completely like reoriented my relationship with birds because my six-year-old has a relationship with her grandmother who teaches her the names of the birds around. And so now birds are no longer like – ambient things that I'm not noticing because my daughter doesn't give me that opportunity. She's like, hey, look at that robin. Hey, look at that cardinal. And so I no longer have like the option to sort of walk through the world not noticing birds. And it has kind of made me realize that for years and years, I've just been missing like a whole part of my immediate environment, right? Exactly. And that's really all being a birder is you walk through the world with a little bit more consciousness. You're, you're, you're noticing and paying attention through, through your eyes and through your ears to the birds around you. It doesn't take special equipment. It doesn't take special knowledge. And you'll start to figure it out. And then, you know, other birders, we love to help. You know, we see a new birder <laughs> and we're like, oh, my God. OK, there's this and this. And oh, yeah, you got to see this and wait till you see this one. And we get all excited. I was going to say, so you called your memoir Better Living Through Birding. I'm curious, how do birds teach us to live better? It's more a matter of how do birds get us outside of ourselves? Mm. And how do birds get it? Because when you're birding, you know, what, first of all, being outdoors, being in nature alone, that alone is incredibly healing. And they've done studies on this. But when you're yeah. birding, you've got to focus on looking for a particular kind of motion. You're listening for different sounds. And you can't do those things without whatever is focused on your in your head, whatever is preying on your mind, that all slips away for a little while because yeah. you're engaging completely with the natural world beyond you and it's absorbing you and you're learning things from it. And then, you know, for a little while, everything is copacetic and all those other things are gone. You know, they'll come back, but yeah. for a little while they're gone. I was going to say, like, what you're describing a form of meditation, right? Like a form of, like, sort of a, a, a single focus that is like, let me just clear all the other thoughts. This is where I'm trying to direct my attention. Exactly. And at the same time, you know, the wild is giving you an incredible sense sunset or a mountain backdrop or, yeah. you know, trees that are leafing out for the first time this spring. So you're just absorbing all of that. And and, and plus, if you are able and, and walking as you're taking a, a bird, your bird outing, yeah. you're just walking is, is, is a form of, you know, meditation. Yeah. So it's, it's, it works. We should tell people, uh, because we are on the radio, that as we have this conversation, you've just been smiling for the past like eight minutes. Plus, <laughs> as you just started to talk about burning, let's talk about your new show. Let's talk about the new show and how you want to bring this energy to it. What's your mission? If the show gets people to do what you said your six-year-old got you doing, <laughs> to notice the birds around you, yeah. mission accomplished. And that's really what the show is. It's just, there's, there's six episodes, and each episode takes us to a different location in the United States. We have to keep it domestic for budget and, and, and uh, COVID reasons. Yeah. Um, but we go to a different location, and we explore the birds, but not just the birds of that place, but the birds and the people issues and how they mm. collide, how they, the negative impacts, the positive ones and how we can do better. And so it, it's just a lot of fun. It was certainly a lot of fun for me to do. And I hope that comes through, you know, in the screen. Cause you know, they said, Oh, would you like to do a birding show and go around the country and, and talk about birds? And I'm like, Hmm, let me think about that. <laughs> okay. I'm in. <laughs> We should also say you're very hands-on here. I love this episode where you handle a herring gull in New York. Let's play the clip. Oh. <laughs> She's not going to be nice to you. She's going to try to bite you. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm. Yeah, good. Oh! Hold the, the head, always, always, yep, yep, always. Yep, yep. 
Can you can you just describe what's happening there? <laughs> sure. Uh, so so we are trying to band a herring gull on top of the green roof of the Jacob Javits Center, the huge convention center in in New York City. So I'm holding the herring gull, trying to restrain it. And this is a strong bird, but most important importantly, it has a beak that is capable of um, cracking open, you know, like shells and things. So <laughs> I've got to you know be careful so as not to to you know have this bird latch onto me. I failed and it <laughs> grabbed hold of my cheek and it's clamping down. And I'm like, I'm th after that, I named the bird Barbarella after a line <laughs> in the movie where, where the villain says, my face, how dare you endanger my face? And that's all I could think of was uh, that, that scene is the bird chewed down on my cheek. And what did we learn from this moment, Christian? <laughs> hold gulls more carefully. <laughs> Noted. But also bird watching, but I think generally like the outdoors in general are spaces that when I think about them, I think that they've excluded black people. I, I, as a black person, I don't necessarily think of myself as an outdoors person. I, don't, I think most of the messaging about being in the outdoors, like most of the marketing um, when it comes to like hiking, uh, camping, like all, all of these ideas, like they don't really include a lot of black people. Why do you think that is? Oh, there's a lot of reasons for it, but you're absolutely correct that um, black and brown people, you know, go to the national parks, go to use the outdoors far less than our proportion in the population. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of structural reasons for that. You mentioned some of them. I think some of them are in terms of legacy um, problems that affect our communities, um, built in barriers for example, if you are working two or three jobs to keep a roof over your head, you're not necessarily going to have the money to be able to send your kids to a summer camp where they can develop an appreciation for nature. They're not going to have that connection to nature to want to go out to the parks, to the great outdoors. Mm. So we've got a lot of things we got to overcome. But uh, And that's one of the things I'm hoping the show will do is get a lot of black and brown kids thinking, oh, he's He's looking at birds. He's in the outdoors. Maybe I can do that because it's so much easier to picture yourself doing it if you can see somebody who looks like you already doing it. So that's the adage, that right? Happen. The adage is you can't be it if you can't see it. The, the, exactly. What, can you just tell me what set you apart? Like what made you from an early age go, you know what? This is a space that I belong in, do you think? I didn't have a choice. Um, first of all, my father, <laughs> was, yeah, my father was a, a science teacher. So nature was always huge in our household. Yeah. And with me, it, it just happened to take the particular form of birds. I put a bird feeder in the backyard, filled it with seed and kept wondering what all the crows with red on the wings were that kept coming to eat the seed. And I got all excited because I thought, thought I'd discovered a new species of crow. And then I found out, no, those are red-winged blackbirds. So, <laughs> but that but that revelation was like, oh, there are things called red-winged blackbirds? And it just snowballed from there. Yeah. And, you know, after that, I, I was lost. <laughs> It's a it's a beautiful thing to be lost in a new thing, right? There's something something really truly captivating about this childlike moment where you go, "This is my thing. I'm going to go deeper and deeper into this." Uh, last question to you: There's somebody listening right now who's like, "You know what? I have been curious about bird watching. I don't really know where to start." Or maybe they've started, but they're like, I'm casual. I don't want to, you know, I'm not diving too deeply into this world. You've been at this for a long time. What's the best advice that you ever got in terms of bird watching? The best advice I got was. Just open yourself up. You don't have to have a pair of binoculars. You know, you if you're a casual person, you're thinking, yeah, maybe, maybe not. You don't, you don't have to invest in any fancy equipment. Just step outside and look and listen. And if you're homebound, just go to the window and look outside the window and look and listen. That's all it takes to get started, to be a birder, and the rest will come. Christian, I wish people could see the giant smile that comes on your face as you talk about birding. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for being on the show. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take your advice, which is also my daughter, my six-year-old daughter's advice. I just like spend some time with some birds, man. But I appreciate you being here. Thank you. My pleasure. Christian Cooper hosts a new show for National Geographic called Extraordinary Birder. You can watch it on Disney+. Plus. Watch me That is Dua Lipa, Dance the Night. That is from the Barbie soundtrack. 
The reason we're playing it, you know the reason we're playing it, is because it is upon us. Finally, the Barbie movie arrives in theaters tomorrow. Oppenheimer also arrives in theaters tomorrow. So you can imagine that this show is going to make a really big fuss out of both of those events tomorrow. It's our Barbenheimer show. I hope to see you then. Until then, my name is Alamin Abdul Mahmoud. This show is called Commotion. I hope you had a great time today. I hope you come back tomorrow because I'm going to be here. So if you're going to be here, I think we should dance. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs>